Hello, climbers. This is Base Camp, a climbing magazine podcast, and I'm your host, Kevin Riley. We got a great episode for you. I was in New England last week and got to stop by Mark Sinnott's home in Jackson, New Hampshire, and speak to him about his life and his book, The Impossible Climb, Alex Honnold, El Capitan, and The Climbing Life. As many of you know, Mark is a legendary climber, a phenomenal storyteller and writer, and actually a former Climbing Magazine intern and contributing editor. We talked about his early days growing up in Wellesley, Mass. in the White Mountains, living the dirtbag lifestyle, his highly documented and drama-filled trip to the Great Trango Tower with Alex Lowe and Jaron Ogden, and much, much more. The interview is a bit long, so we're going to forego the usual issue preview, but it should be noted that Climbing's December-January issue hits newsstands today. We have a stunning cover photo of Brittany Gorris on the classic finger crack City Park in Index, Washington, and a feature about Index that is written by Chris Coleman, the author of As Above, So Below. For all you boulders out there, Chris Schulte wrote a feature about font circuits that you're going to love, and Ula Krobach wrote a piece about the fear of falling. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have a thrilling feature about the evolution of headpointing on Peak District Gritstone with words and photos by Mike Hutton. Plus, we got six steps to better your footwork, rescue repel 911, and the death of the climber ego. So like I said, we got a long-form interview with Mark Sinnott, so let's jump right into it. But first, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Mystery Ranch, based in Bozeman, Montana. Mystery Ranch builds the best load-bearing equipment in the world for men and women with the job to do. Made with the best materials available and the most durable construction methods that exist to support your mission, whether it's on the front line, the fire line, the cleanest line, or the steepest line. At the last International Climbers Festival, I connected with Becky Switzer, Mystery Ranch ambassador, got to ask her what she loves about Mystery Ranch and its products. So, Becky, how's your International Climbers Festival going? Oh, it's great. It's always inspiring to see all the folks who travel across the country to come to Wyoming. Yeah, and it's so beautiful here in City Park, just hanging out by the river and all the camping. It's really a special place. Yeah, Lander is really the perfect place for this event. How did you get connected with Mystery Ranch? So, I've known people in their crew for over a decade. I started out with a ski pack of theirs and have always been impressed with the quality, the construction, the durability. It's just a great company because it matches with my activities, climbing being the primary one, but also skiing and ice climbing. Yeah, and what do you love about the packs? They carry a lot of weight very easily, especially with the new Tower 47 coming out, the Kragging Pack. It can take a ton of weight and it can feel really good on your back. And one of the neat things about Mystery Ranch is that it's really customizable. So being a shorter female with a short torso, this pack fits me great. If I'm carrying an 80 meter rope and 20 draws, like it's totally manageable. Fall 2019 marks Mystery Ranch's debut back in the technical climbing packs with the launch of the new Scepter series, specifically designed for ice climbers. Then in spring 2020, Mystery Ranch welcomes three more rock specific packs into the collection, including the Tower 47. Learn more at mysteryranch.com. Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. 1998, I bought a little crappy house on the other side of town. I got it when you could still get a cheap house in this town. Yeah. And uh, my dad and I always wanted to live here because this place is sick. Like, we have an incredible view and the backyard is National Forest. And so I was always angling on it. And my dad, and I'd tell my dad, you know, that I was going to buy it from him. And, and he would say, no way, man. He's like, you... You're you're a climber. You have no money. You're never gonna pull it off. <laughs> he wouldn't give you a deal on it. He he, uh, he basically was telling me it was not gonna happen. And then that house over there, we bought it for sixty nine grand, and we sold it for three twenty nine. Wow. And I took the money and went to my dad, and I'm like, we're gonna make a deal. He moved to Florida, and I bought it from him. Awesome. Seven. Well, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, at least so he pulled can... it off. <laughs> but it was like, you know, typical of my dad that, uh, yeah, there was going to be no deal. Uh huh. He's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not just going to give you a house. Even if he could afford to, uh -huh. he wouldn't do it. Are you close with your dad? Um, not anymore because he's not around. Oh, I'm sorry to he hear died that. In 2010, unfortunately. Yeah, that's difficult. Yep. Um, but I, we, we, it, we had a thorny relationship actually. Um, it's a long story, but it has, <laughs> it has a lot to do with who I am you yeah. know, and how I became, you know, myself. 
Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a long story. Yeah. It's unfortunate he's not still around so he could see, you know, everything that you've done um, with the impossible climb and all the stuff you've done recently. Did you see the little part that I put in at the end about how I thought my dad would be proud, you know, Mm -hmm. to see it? Because he was one of those guys that, uh, kind of like a tough love style of parenting where he just wouldn't give it up no matter how well you did. It was never good enough. And I, you know, like a, a, you know, a kid wants their, their parents approval. And I think for, for a boy, it's a really important thing to get that from your dad. And my dad just wouldn't give it up. And, uh, boy, it led to a lot of really crazy stuff. I I think it caused me to rebel, um, you know, in a big way when I was in high school. And was that just getting in trouble? Yeah. Partying and stuff like that? Yeah. All that kind of stuff, you know, that, that, um, that some of us get into, get into trouble, basically. (laughs) There's quite a bit of that when I was in high school. I'm a tiny bit reluctant to tell those stories. Yeah, you don't have to. my kids don't even really know about any of that. You think you'll ever share it with them? Um, They've gotten, you know, like some, some little glimpses, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I went a little, I went a little wild and I think that, uh, you know, part of it was, was just because I, like built up so much angst, you know, from my dad, just, you know, not giving me any approval, you know, for anything that I did. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, I think it kind of forged, you know, a certain personality Mm -hmm. and possibly like some strength, um, that I might not have other, have had otherwise. So I'm, I'm not really sure, but, uh, I'm trying to, you know, for myself as a parent, to be a, a little bit more giving mm-hmm. and to uh, be a bit more nurturing. But, you know, the little piece that I've taken away from it with my dad is sort of like this idea that I'm not going to give it up for nothing. I'm not into like everybody gets a trophy and <laughs> you get a lot of praise even if you don't try hard. Yeah. Like I really don't like that. So, you know, you kind of have to earn it. Mm-hmm. But if you do, then you're going to then you're going to get it. Yeah. So what were the influences as a, as a kid growing up that really impacted you when you were younger? Were you into music? Were you into team sports? I was into team sports. I um, was never like a big music person. My dad was a musician actually, and Uh-oh. he wanted me you know, to be into music and to play musical instruments. And I was terrible at it. I played the clarinet uh-huh. in fourth grade and I sucked <laughs> and, and I, it didn't call to me, you know, so that, that kind of fell by the wayside. I think the, um, you know, the stuff that, that, uh, that the, was the most formative for me was, um, all of the exposure that I got to the outdoors, mm-hmm. particularly up here in the White Mountains where we're sitting right now. So I grew up in this um, little town outside of Boston called Wellesley. Mm-hmm. Yep. And when I was probably like six or seven years old, my parents bought a house here in in Jackson, New Hampshire. And the the reason is that my dad was really into skiing. And so, and he also, uh, well, he was a banker in Boston. And so he just wanted to get out of the city. Yeah. And, uh, and he was religious about it. And it was every weekend, 52 weekends out of the year. And, you know, on Friday nights, we would pick up my dad at the bank and we would, we would drive up here. And then we did all kinds of outdoor stuff. We did tons of skiing. Um, we did hiking and, uh. You know, I tell some of these stories in my book, but that's where I, I got my first exposure to climbing, going to Cathedral Ledge as a little kid, basically, and watching people climb. Mm-hmm. And I, I tell this story a lot when I do talks about, like, looking back, we went to the cliff far more than was normal uh-huh. and, because we weren't climbers. And it was never, you, you know, even remotely considered, as far as I know, that we would climb anything. Yeah. But we were watching them, other people do it, 
pretty much every weekend. Yeah. And we would go to the base of the cliff and we'd watch them with the binoculars. It was like a whole thing. We had a whole routine. And then we'd go to the top and there's the overlook there, as you know. Mm -hmm. And we would watch them top out. And I guess the, the, the funny thing about it, you know, now having been up there like thousands of times, you know, doing my own climbs on Cathedral my dad would actually climb over the chain link fence. And at the top of the prow, there's this scrappy little pine tree that's still there that hangs out over the cliff. And my dad would go out to that tree <laughs> and hang on to it and look down the wall. And I was behind the fence. Yeah. You know, I was like an eight year old kid and I was, you know, champing at the bit to get over the fence too. And he was always like, no way, man, you stay back there. Don't come over here. And I feel like that fence. It, it, it was kind of like a symbolic barrier between mm -hmm. the horizontal realm where I, you know, was existing in this vertical realm where other people were climbing and it just kind of seeped in. And, uh, and I don't think my dad realized the seed that he was planting, but for yeah. sure, that's, that's where, it, where it came from, I think more than anything. Well, when did you actually get to go climbing for yourself? I think it started... Um, probably in 1985 when mm -hmm. I was like 15 years old and, um, well, I had this, this, this club and I, and I tell this story in my book and it was called the crazy kids of America. And basically my hero was evil Knievel uh -huh. and I, um, loved, uh, just like everything that he stood for and just the, the whole idea of being a daredevil and, um, I wanted to be a mini daredevil mm -hmm. and, uh, my friends and I were really into BMX. And so we would build our own like mini, like Caesar palace type jumps that we would do on our bikes. And, uh, I think the, um, the clubs that I had were all, um, built around, trying to motivate my friends to be crazier than they were uh -huh. because and you were the craziest i i think <laughs> that would be a fair thing to say yeah um and i don't really know why but i think part of it was that i was one of these kids that would go absolutely mental if life was boring uh -huh. i couldn't handle it at all um and like now as an adult it's like life is so crazy that I guess I don't have to worry about being bored <laughs> as a kid. Yeah. Being bored was a bad thing. And I think when I was, when I was little, I figured out that if I was bored, I could just go outside and yeah. I could just start doing crazy stuff. And then I wouldn't be, then I wouldn't be bored anymore. But I, I guess I figured out pretty quick that it wasn't that fun to do it by myself. Mm -hmm. And that it was way more fun to like kind of feed off the energy of other people doing this stuff with you and like the camaraderie of it all and like egging people on. I was really into that and I was like kind of good at it and sort of <laughs> persuasive. Uh -huh. But you know, the kids, they, the kids in my neighborhood and my friends, they weren't crazy enough and I needed ways to motivate them. And it, it started with this book of matches I guess I think I told this story in the book, but um, my dad had this fancy old wooden desk. It was like his banker's desk. And it was one of those where it had these secret compartments and you had like pull out a combination of drawers and then like this sort of little secret cubby would pull out. And he had uh -huh. stuff stashed in all of those things. And he eventually got into um, like consulting and he was writing books and he was traveling all around the world and he was going to the far east a lot and he lived in hong kong and he'd get all this like cool stuff on his travels and he'd stash it away in the desk and so when he when he whenever he wasn't there i was in that desk looking for stuff yeah and um and i you know i don't think he was a very observant man and you know really good at certain details, but he's not going to remember about some random thing that he put in his desk. So mm -hmm. I could snag this stuff and he would never know. Yeah. And, um, I had my own little stashes, you know, where I'd put it all. And one day I found this box of fancy wooden matches that had gold tips. Huh. And I guess I had never really seen anything like that. And I was kind of a 
getting into pyromania and like burning <laughs> things. And I had yeah. this secret little spot in the woods behind my house where I would, where I'd burn everything. And so I, I was like, okay, cool. I got these matches. And, um, I went to the bus stop and all my little buddies were there and I pulled out the matches to show them. And I remember one of the kids in particular really kind of being equally in awe of the matches the way that I was and he want he wanted one and we were we were at the bus stop and uh there was a little pond there it's called the Rock Ridge Pond and it was I guess early winter and there was like a thin layer of ice on the on the pond but it wasn't the kind of ice you could go out on and there was this basically like a Dixie cup floating out in the ice pretty far out from shore and I have no idea how this came into my mind and I fully accept if any like parents would hate me for this uh -huh. but I said to this <laughs> this kid <laughs> you know he was my peer he's my same age I know who he is I, I haven't like mentioned his name but I was like, dude, you, you want this match? You got to go get that cup. <laughs> and, um, this was a kid who previously had not been that motivated to do crazy stuff. And basically two seconds later, he was breaking his way through thin ice, like up to his neck mm -hmm. in a pond in December. And he got the cup and then he got the match. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of an important moment because I realized, um, the power, you know, that like ideas could have over, over people. The other kids saw it too. And then it turned into this club that I called the golden fellows. Mm -hmm. And, and it was all about getting the match and, uh, and the kids would do insane things to get the matches. But eventually I ran out. And so then that was when I started the next bigger club that went much further and um, which I, I talk about in some detail in the in the book, and it's called, it was called the Crazy Kids of America. Mm -hmm. And this escalated to where you guys would go and do crazy things on the cliff. Is that where the climbing yes, came in? It did eventually, and uh, yeah, I think you were already kind of drive me there, but uh, I guess it was probably inevitable that we were going to eventually realized that this giant cliff was just sitting there and we could go and climb it and so that was um when i was about 15 years old mm -hmm. and uh my buddy and i grabbed a rope from the tool shed um at my house and then went to my dad and asked him to give us a ride into cathedral ledge and you know this was the guy that you know, that I've been describing who was like the quintessential like 1980s style, like anti-helicopter parent who didn't really notice a whole lot of stuff mm -hmm. um, that I was doing. Um, but when he dropped us off at the cliff and we got out of the car, I remember it as one of the only times that he had no that he noticed that something was up because there were the two kids with the clothesline we had the Converse Chuck Taylors all laced up, and then there was the Cathedral Ledge in the background. Uh, I mean, most parents would be absolutely horrified you <laughs> yeah. know, to like see that kind of thing. <laughs> and my dad was sitting there in the um, in the car, and I remember him having his hand hanging out, and it was against the wood panel on the side of the car. And he looked over at me and he said, "Hey, Mark, what's going on?" And I said, hey, dad, don't worry about it. And he and he looked at me and he kind of sized it up and he had his arm here and he went and he just slapped the wood panel and said, sounds good. And just drove away and left my buddy and I like Whoa. he basically didn't care. And, <laughs> uh, and so then we um, proceeded to make our first climb of Cathedral Ledge and we, we, we went up this thing called the Big Flush. Uh-huh. And you can look it up, you know, I mean, it might not even be like <laughs> guidebooks or anything, but uh, it kind of is this gully in the middle of the cliff. We made it, I think, within about 50 feet of the top of the wall with our clothesline, which was, you know, kind of ambitious. We we ended up wandering all over the cliff. I've gone back. I know uh, we did s several different routes. We were into off widths and stuff like uh -huh. that. And um, I guess I can say that we were climbing 5'8". Okay. Wow. And 
and then just like doing climbs where we would get up to anchors on little ledges with pitons and i don't even know how we made it down Mm -hmm. i mean i remember like feeding the rope through the eyes of pitons and like batmaning down ropes and (sighs) stuff like that so it's just like horrifying to think of as a parent anybody doing that but but you know things were pretty loose back in those days it seems like in terms of parenting and i can tell you that it's not like that with me at Mm -hmm. all um, in terms of how I parent, I'm more of a helicopter parent, which some people find surprising, but uh, yeah, I'm worried about stuff and I'm like, just like the thing that I'm afraid of most in life is that something bad would happen to any of my children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's pretty scary. So what type of gear were you using? I mean, you mentioned you had pitons and, and the rope. I mean, did you have chalk stones and stuff like that you were using as well? Well, we didn't have pitons. We just found them. You found them. They were in the rock. We didn't have anything <laughs> except for the clothesline. That's it. And we had, we kind of had our um, our ethos, which was the first guy just has to go for it. Yeah. And then and you, you don't had to fall. find some way. And you know, you can't fall. Yeah. There's no fall. You can't fall. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's for sure. Because uh, there was nothing, you know, holding you up. But the first guy just has to totally go for it. And then he needs to find a way to secure the rope for uh-huh. the second guy. And on one of the climbs, which I think has since fallen off, but it was this off with over by uh, White Eye, which is right outside the cathedral roof. I went up this one thing and I, I really don't know what I was thinking. It's basically a five, seven off with, and it's like pretty much a legit, like steep climb. And I got to the top and luckily... There was a piton, a ring, a ring angle piton, and so I untied from the rope and I put it through the uh, through the ring, and then I was just pulling it in hand over hand <laughs> as my buddy was coming up, and he got right below me and looked up and um, said something like, you know, I don't know if I can do this, I'm gonna fall. And I was just holding the rope with my hands, <laughs> and I, and he was pretty close to the top, and I remember yeah. looking at him being like really like okay but i'll hold on as best i can but it's your call you know i i mean maybe you could try a little harder that that would be wise and i guess he did and he didn't yeah he didn't fall and he dug deep and i don't know how we got down but i bet we put the rope through the uh through the piton and Mm -hmm. then went batman style down the rope we actually came down we rappelled down still in saigon you've probably done Mm -hmm. that climb yeah we rappelled down that with the clothesline with no harnesses or anything. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I don't see people doing this kind of stuff anymore, but yeah, really and truly, that's how it started for me. And um, I pretty quickly... Okay, well, one other story was... So we, we, we had some forays on Cathedral Ledge, and then I, I... When I ran into some real climbers on the cliff, and... I saw the gear for the first time. I had no idea any of it existed, even though I should have known because I had seen climbers before, but I just didn't Mm -hmm. get it. And then I was like, okay, like, yeah, climbing. And I saw the shoes, like the freaky little boots. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I need those. So I I made my mom take me to the uh, sort of like sporting goods store in Wellesley, which was called Olkins. And told the guy, yeah, you know, I need climbing shoes. And so he pulled out these these boots, and I put them on, and I'm like, yeah, I'm like that's that looks like climbing shoe to me. Like I think we're good. And so then I there was this little boulder in town, and I went out and I was climbing on it. It was called the Bates Boulder, and I remember looking down at my new boot on the rock and being so stoked. Because that was a rock shoe. Yeah. It was on rock. And then this other guy showed up, who I knew, and he's climbing, and he puts on these other boots, and his boots are very different from mine. But I was like, well, I'm like, he must just have, like, a different kind than I do. And we at one point, we were side by side on the rock, and I said, hey, dude, you know, check out these new climbing shoes I got. And he just kind of laughed. And he's like, dude, those are hiking boots. <laughs> And I was like, what? What are you talking about? No, I just got these at Olkins. These are rock climbing shoes. And he's like, dude, they're not. 
those are New Balance hiking boots. <laughs> <laughs> I was so bummed, just crushed and uh, jumped down off the rock and just like rode my bike home, like, you know, all pissed off. But uh -huh. shortly after that, I figured it out and I got yeah. climbing shoes and started working on the uh, apprenticeship. Yeah. And so were you running into other climbers around like Wellesley? Like Henry Barber's from Wellesley, right? Did you ever run into Henry him? was long gone by that point. You know? Yeah. I mean, he was hot Henry at that point, pretty much. I mean, I guess maybe he was a little bit past that point, but he, he wasn't around. I, you know, I slowly started figuring that stuff out by going to the library discovering that there was a whole section of climbing and mountaineering books and basically reading them all. Mm -hmm. I remember the Wellesley Free Library having two shelves, two, you know, good sized long shelves that were covered with mountaineering books and pretty much reading every one. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I remember um, reading um, Henry's book, which is like On Edge maybe or okay. something like yeah. that. No, and... Um, starting to, uh, you know, educate myself about the whole thing, but, um, nobody really climbed there too much. Although there, there's still this really classic climbing area in Wellesley called the Wobbin Arches. Okay. And it's a granite aqueduct. Yeah. I've seen that big, in the Boston rocks. Book. Yeah. It's really cool. And so that's kind of where we, we cut our teeth as climbers. And the funny thing was in the whole town, there was nobody that climbed except for, well, basically there was three people. One of them was me, and the other one was my buddy Simon, and this kid Baker. Uh -huh. And the three of us lived like this in three houses. We were all neighbors. And we all got into it independently of each other, and it was bizarre. Because huh. I don't know of anybody else in the town that climbed. Um, but the three of us kind of became, you know, like a three musketeers kind of thing. We started climbing and um hitting the arches i mean yeah. we started out you know we figured out okay like there's ropes there's carabiners because on yeah. cathedral ledge i saw guys deploy carabiners we were at the same anchor on still in saigon and i had climbed up there with the clothesline and they had climbed up with all their gear and, and then set an anchor and i watched them do that and thought okay those snapling things look really really useful <laughs> for a rock climber <laughs> yeah, I and uh, we had this one buddy whose brother did like knolls or outward bound uh -huh. and we went and raided his closet and we found two carabiners and then i bought a gold line you know what those are no, they're like I don't. these old laid um static lines okay so they're like braided rope i got one of those at a, a garage sale i had the new balance which i knew weren't really climbing shoes now but they were better than the chuck taylor's sure. so i'm like this is gonna work for now and then i found in boston we rode the t into boston i found a burned out volkswagen bug basically like in the combat zone of boston and i cut the seat belts out of it and i made a <laughs> swami belt and then i started top roping at the arches <laughs> yeah. that's awesome yes so it sounds like you got pretty into it pretty quickly. Did you know, like, you wanted this to be a career? I mean, not that many climbers out there were making climbing a career at this time, but I imagine that's, you know, you were so obsessed, it's all you really wanted to do. Yeah. So I was one of those people that never really had a plan. Uh huh. When I. So I studied philosophy in college. Where'd and, you go to uh, school? I went to Middlebury College in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I was a philosophy major. And when I graduated, I had no plan. But uh -huh. I was... Um, basically, I only had one thing that I really cared about, and that was climbing. Yeah. And um, I was a little bit of a freak, I guess you could say, in that I... Like my dream was to move somewhere out into the middle of nowhere and live in a shack by myself. Mm -hmm. And like, I didn't want to be part of society. Yeah. And I didn't want to have a career. And uh -huh. I specifically planned not to have one. And part of the reason was because 
I had kind of seen my exposure to what that was and what it meant was watching and observing my dad. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that he really enjoyed being a banker too much. And basically all those rides that we would make from Boston up to New Hampshire, you know, I'm, I'm this kid who can't handle being bored and I'm sitting in the car for three hours each way, like over and over and over, like thousands of rides. And there's nothing going on. There's no video games. There's like nothing like that. There's no screens. You just have to sit there. And my parents were talking. My and and my dad was always talking about banking, about his job. Yeah. And I absorbed like thousands of hours of <laughs> listening to what it was like to be a banker. And it had a huge impact on the way that I saw the world. So when I and I guess I thought that you could not have a career and I guess you can not have a career, yeah. but I specifically thought, okay, well, I'm not going to do that, but I have my thing, which I'm really into and it's climbing. Mm-hmm. And, um, I did my first trip out West in 1988 after I graduated from, from high school. And actually I took a year off cause I really didn't even want to go to college, but I knew I had to, my parents were going to make me. Yeah. And so I, the first thing I did was I, I had a landscaping business and I worked over the summer and then I went to France and I did kind of like a climbing vagabond thing in the South of France and like sport climbing and mm-hmm. all that, and like Verdun Gorge and Bukes and the yeah. Colonks and all that. It was awesome. Um, then I came back and, uh, my buddies and I, set up a van sort of a little bit like this not this nice but it was like a ford econoline yeah we paneled the whole inside we made beds we had like secret compartments and all that kind of stuff and then we drove out west and uh, we ended up in um, summit county we worked at uh, copper mountain over the winter and then in the spring we bought motorcycles and we rode down we rode cross country then we went down baja then we and we went back up like Highway One in California, and we ended up in Yosemite. Mm-hmm. And now having this perspective of being the parent of a of a kid who's a junior in college, and he's asking me, "Hey, like I'm going to do this internship, and hey, what do you think about this and career?" And we were talking about that a little while ago. Inside, I'm realizing it's a time of life where you can. Um, like go in a certain direction, it can kind of chart out your whole path without you even realizing that it that it's going to happen. I mean, if you choose poorly and you go to do something, you know, um, that's not fun, you know, that could pinch off. But if you choose wisely and you find something cool, I mean, there's probably like 10 different cool things like that you could do, but you pick one and you're like, wow, I'm kind of into this. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, you know, you're 50 years old yeah. and you've been doing that same thing the entire time. And when I look back, I realize like on that first trip, I could have gone to like the Cascades, you know, or yeah. I could have gone to, you know, like big snowy mountains. And I was pretty into that idea. You know, I was uh-huh. like, like a hugely um, influential book for me was um, Reinhold Messner's All 14 8,000ers. Yeah. And I was aspiring, you know, for like super alpinism, I called it. And so I could have gone in that direction pretty easily. But what happened was I went to Yosemite and it just locked it in. And when you go to Yosemite and you're a young climber and you grew up climbing in the White Mountains and you climb Cathedral Ledge and you climb Cannon, and then you see Half Dome and El Capitan, it's, it's like you have to climb those cliffs. And it sucked me in mm-hmm. super hard. And and so then that became my path. And that's what um, drew me into big wall climbing. But there was, there was never a, a plan. I lived in my cave in Yosemite. Yeah. Like off and on for seven years. <laughs> and I didn't... How were you supporting yourself during all of this? I would come and go, you know, it, it, some... Were you some a North the, Face athlete at this nope, point? No. Nope, not yet. Like some of the stuff, um, you know, like some of my early years in Yosemite, I was doing like extreme can collecting. <laughs> and I did that at UMass when I was in college. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's like if you're living in a cave and all you're trying to do is climb. Yeah, you It was like the much. toughest decision. They would only take 24 cans at a time. Uh-huh. So you couldn't bring more than a case. <laughs> 
and you'd get a buck 20 <laughs> and it just happened to be, you know, the price for like a King Cobra beer mm -hmm. or a little bit of food. And it was yeah. always like such a tough call. <laughs> like, what am I going to get? But, uh, I also, um, I would carry loads up to half dome. I got the, um, the death slabs approach, like totally completely wired. Yeah. And most people didn't really know it very well back then. And I would charge $20 and I would take a haul bag to the base of half dome up the death slabs. And I thought that I was like ripping these people off you know? <laughs> and they would have hiked eight miles around with yeah. these giant haul bags. And I could go up it really quick and I'd be like, dude, give me 20 bucks. This bag will be at the base of the regular route. And I'd cruise them up there and I'd do that. And then I had this other thing that I did where I would, I would go and I would climb easy routes that kind of like beginner climbers were doing mm -hmm. and because they were the ones that would always get their gear stuck and then i would take the pieces out and i would sell them on the bulletin board and so for a while i was basically living like that just full hand to mouth and you know scrounging and all that kind of stuff and um and then i um i got into doing construction and i um, became an apprentice carpenter in colorado uh -huh. and i I remember... Um, Where in Colorado? I was in Fort Collins. Oh, okay. And I remember um, watching this film, and it was about Greg Child and Tom Hargis, and I think it was Tim McCartney Snape when they climbed Gasherbrum 4 in the Karakorum. Mm -hmm. And Tom Hargis in that film talked about how he did construction because it was a good occupation for a, for a transient climber. And I thought, okay, well, that's that's me. That's what I'm going to do. And so I got into doing construction in uh, Fort Collins. I started out as a temp laborer for Apple One Temp Agency. And I was picking up scraps where they were building a um, one of those supermarkets in Loveland, Colorado. I was making four seventy five an hour, I yeah. think. I worked full time, and my pay was like $175 a week. And I would sleep on people's couches and in my car. And then whenever I got enough... Well, then I started working my way up through the ranks through carpentry. And I eventually became a framer and I started learning like how to actually build houses and all that. And, you know, I've talked a lot about my dad and I guess at some point I can talk about my mom too. But my dad, you know, part of like the way I was describing him is kind of like this, this Protestant work ethic thing in our mm -hmm. family. And so along with the other stuff I was describing, he was hammering that into my sister and I, and he was demonstrating it. Yeah. Like all he did was work. And so that's pretty much how it was. And I realized pretty early on that work was boring unless you worked really hard. And if you worked really hard, then it wasn't boring. So hmm. in construction in Colorado, you know, and like early mid 90s not everybody was working as hard as me and most yeah. people weren't and so i would bust ass and you know sleeping on couches i'd start started making like some decent money once i actually learned how to do carpentry and i would get some cash together and we'd finish a house and then i'd go to my boss and i'd say hey man i'm out of here and i'm going to yosemite and i would drive uh -huh. back and forth from colorado to yosemite over and over I spent tons of time out there in the winter, did like lots of winter ascents on El Cap and other cliffs. And when and then I'd run out of money and I'd go back to Colorado and my boss would always hire me back. Nice. Because they were always just like moving from one house to another and he knew that I would do good work and that mm -hmm. I would work uh, that I would work really hard. So I guess I had that going on for a while and I remember being in Yosemite and reading in Climbing Magazine about the North Face Dream Team, they were uh -huh. calling it. They had just started it, and it was probably like 1994, 95. And I remember sitting around in the deli, and, the, you know, we called it the center of the universe, and there were all these climbers there, and, you know, some of them were like a little jade, and there were definitely people who were jealous of the people that were in the magazine, you know. Yeah, the, of course. The sponsored people that we weren't. And, you know... This may still go on to this day. I think people generally are nicer and a little more mature now, but we'd go through the magazine, just go page by page, just ripping on everybody. You know? <laughs> Total sellout, totally. you know, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, 
we got to the North Face Dream Team thing, uh-huh. and like these people were so legendary, yeah, and it was so rad that we were like, hmm, I don't know, like this is actually pretty cool, sure, and. And there was um, some pretty ambitious climbers, you know, who were around in, in that crew back then. and um, Like Conrad and Alex. Um, and... Yeah, those guys, you know, were, were the actual dream team. But then amongst the dirtbags in Yosemite, there were oh. some good climbers, just like there always are. Yeah. And, you know, there were, there were a few people who started thinking, well, all right, you know, like, how do you get in on this? Uh-huh. And... Um, I certainly never thought that there was, I mean, I thought there was no possible chance, you know, of actually pulling that off, but I was climbing with this guy named Warren Hollinger Mm -hmm. and Warren, you know, to this day, I'm sure is just a natural born salesman and incredibly confident and has a ton of, um, charisma and just mojo Yeah, and was really good at climbing. And I think... That so so we had a, a a plan to go to Baffin Island, and we were training in Yosemite to go to Baffin, and that was the the dream, you know, to like go and find a cliff like the ones in Yosemite, but somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And I'm pretty sure that Warren just called Conrad, and I think Conrad was the athlete manager at the North Face back then, and he just called him and just started sweet talking him. <laughs> and I remember him, I remember Warren calling me and and saying, dude you got a North Face jacket and pants coming your way. <laughs> I had like super probably felt like you scrappy won the lottery. thrift store uh, stuff that probably wasn't even Gore-Tex. It was mm-hmm. covered in duct tape and I couldn't even believe it. We can go inside and I can show you the jacket. It's still okay, cool. hanging in the closet. It's it's really a prized possession because it was kind of like the first free thing that I ever got. And it, mm-hmm. it was the North Face too and, like, you know, kind of legendary. So then we went to Baffin. We went to Baffin twice. The first year we didn't really get any sponsorship. The second year was when we, we, uh, we got it and we did this climb called the Polar Sun Spire. And it was Warren and I and this crazy kid of America, Jeff Chapman, who was the kid that I was doing those climbs with yeah. in the cathedral. And it was kind of this epic climb. And it was, and it took us thirty nine days to get up the cliff. And it was just kind of a sick mission, you mm-hmm. know. And um, and when I when I came back from that, it is when like things sort of started coming into focus because I had my foot in the door with the North Face. Well, I mean, I'd only gotten a jacket, but I was like, okay, well, my foot is in the door. Like I know yeah. somebody there, and I wrote up this massive report about mm-hmm. the pants and the jacket. And I sort of like in school, I I mean, I hate to admit this, but I I was one of those kids that. Uh, there was a certain expectation that I had to meet to keep my parents off my back. And I figured out what was the absolute bare minimum to meet that expectation. <laughs> but I was not engaged with, you know, like trying to gain knowledge or uh-huh. like being like super academic or anything. This report that I wrote for the North Face is like, okay, this is like, I'm going to try really hard now. This is, this is what I would have done in school if I was trying to get an A plus every time mm-hmm. I did something. And so I went hard. And then I was also like a fledgling photographer. Okay. And I was being um, mentored by Jeff Ackey. Oh, wow. Who was the photo yeah. editor at Climbing. And yeah. I had been doing some climbing with Jeff too. Like we did some super cool stuff. Like I think, yeah, I think before that trip, yeah, before that trip, we did the first winter ascent of the Painted Wall in the Black mm, Canyon. Yeah. And we were doing stuff like that. And we were cool. doing like winter ascents in Yosemite and things. And Jeff was mentoring me with the photography and like teaching me how to do it and all that stuff. Um, So I had a nice camera. I had this Nikon FM and I had a good glass and uh, like, you know, the manual focus lenses and everything. And I shot the heck out of that climb. And then I, when I got back, I submitted all of my photos Mm -hmm. and this huge report to the North Face. And I said, here's everything you can have for free. Thanks so much for the jacket. And then, okay, so then I came back here to this yeah. house and I was living in the basement and I told my parents about what I did. My parents had a party for me and there was a banner out right here in the front door and it said, welcome home from the Banff Islands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no one even knew what it was. 
And then for some reason they invited all their friends and not mine. Everybody was like, how's your hike? And I was like, well, it was actually like a 39 day big wall climb. But I don't know if I can really explain that to you. And, but my dad, you know, he had been doing a lot of speaking and he, he heard my story and he's like, Hey, you know, maybe, maybe you should put together a presentation. So I made a one page flyer with a photo and a little blurb about the trip. And I put together a mailing list. I went to the library in Conway and I wrote and I wrote down the address for every student activities office for every college and university in the US, every climbing gym, every outdoor store, did this massive <laughs> mailing. Yeah. Have Mark come and do his talk about the Polar Sun Spire and you pay him two hundred and fifty bucks and we're gonna be good. And and then I called and like yeah. followed up. And I think I got 25 of them. Awesome. And I was supposed to be on my way back to Colorado to mm-hmm. go back to the framing. And I called my boss and I was like, dude, I'm out. Yeah. And then I went on and I got in my Subaru and I started driving around the country doing talks. Started writing for Climbing Magazine. Uh-huh. Got some other writing gigs. Um, weaseled my way in with the North Face. Yeah. Got on kind of like what they, we used to call the B team. Yeah. You know, you're like getting groomed if you're lucky uh-huh. and um had no bills lived out of my car well how did you go from being on the b team to uh going to the great trango tower with alex Lowe and jared ogden because that was a um, pretty big trip and they were doing their expedition videos and they made yeah. that video which was incredible um so yeah so 96 to we went to baffin in 95 we did some good stuff. Then in 96, we did the Polar Sun Spire. Mm-hmm. And the Climbing Magazine gave us a Golden Piton. Nice. Which I don't know if that still exists. We used to I do it. I didn't actually get a Golden Piton. Even, you didn't? No, oh. not even gold-plated. <laughs> but, but they gave it to us. So like yeah. we got some recognition, which was cool. And, um, and it, you know... Like, yeah, I guess B team at that point. And then in 97, I went to a mountain called Shipton Spire. Yeah. With Jared, with Jared. And, um, and we got up that thing too. And we did this route called the Ship of Fools. And it was incredible. Uh-huh. Like just an absolutely stunning route, um, that had every different type of climbing, you know, there is. And I mean, so like we got some kudos for that. And I think it was like right after that when, I got promoted mm-hmm. and, um, and then I was getting to know, um, Greg Child and Alex Lowe and they invited Jared and I to go to Baffin Island with them to do a first ascent that was going to be a documentary for National Geographic. Uh-huh. And we did this thing called the Great Sail Peak and, and that went well. And then, um, at the end of that trip, well, Jared and I, when we went to Shipton, we saw the northwest face of Great Trango Tower. I didn't even know it existed. I never heard anyone talk talk about it. Everybody was always talking about the Norwegian pillar, uh-huh. which is on the east side. And we saw the northwest face, and we were like, holy shit, like, this is a 6,000-foot cliff. I, I couldn't even believe it. And there were these, um, I think it was a Swedish team, and there was climbing Nameless Tower, and they had spotting scope. And nobody had ever even really thought about climbing that thing and i remember glassing it with the scope and just seeing like this crack going all the way up the uh the upper head wall and so jared and i had the plan and we were gonna go in 98 but we got sidetracked by uh by getting invited you know by those guys and they were our heroes you know so it was like incredible like so it was like i mean we're talking maybe like four years from when I was sitting in Yosemite, like reading about these guys. And then I was mm-hmm. going on an expedition with them and I couldn't really believe that it was happening, but I was really, really, um, stoked and, you know, starting to realize, you know, like some of the opportunities that were, that were laying before me. And, um, and so Jared and I had the plan for the great Trango and we initially tried to do it with just the two of us. Mm-hmm. Because we had this incredible partnership, um, and it's still like this today. We're we're still like super good buds, and and we did nine or ten expeditions together, I think, and we um, just had this absolutely perfectly compatible like kindred spirit thing, 
where there was no like kind of jockeying of egos and headbutting and the kind mm-hmm. of thing, which is pretty common on expeditions. And there's like a lot of alpha males and climbing. Yeah. And for some reason, Jared and I just jived perfectly. And we always, um, well, like on Shipton Spire and also on the Great Sail Peak, we just sort of, we had like a, a real uh, similar like aesthetic in terms of like looking at routes and like making decisions, like which way to go and um, logistics and just everything. We always saw eye to eye. So with the Great Trango, we were like, hey, you know what? This is going to be awesome, dude. It'll be me and you and we'll go do it. And we were really um, inspired for this climb. You know, we'd seen it together. We'd been dreaming about it for two years. When we were on Shipped Inspire, we stared at it the whole time. And so then we put it together, put together the proposal. We were brand new, like with the North Face. We're like, hey, this is what we want to do. This is super cool. And they were like, eh, thumbs down. We're not into it. We hit like all these different companies, um, grants, everything. Everybody turned us down. Mm-hmm. And um, we we're trying to decide what to do. And we made the decision to invite Alex Lowe to yeah. be part of the team. And it was, you know, a smart move yeah. because once we got him, he was super into it. Mm-hmm. And um, once we got him on board, it was funny because we went back to all the same companies that had told us no. And they, every one of them changed their tune and said yes. Yeah. <laughs> because Alex was such a big deal in the climbing community. And, um, so we we ended up with more sponsorship than we needed and more than we should have taken on, but we were just kind of naive and innocent, and we didn't know. And we got so much that we got to the point where we were actually getting paid to do the climb. Mm-hmm. And um, and the website Quaka was part of this as well, yeah, right? Yeah. So we got signed up with Quaka, and we kind of had a connection there. They had said no previously, I think. And then uh-huh. when Alex was on board, they were like, yeah, we're really into this, and we're going to pay you. And, you know, we took a ton of shit for it from all the, you know, the purists. Mm-hmm. I would say the so-called purists. <laughs> I think everybody's pretty similar, really, underneath it all. But we were just... We were just naive and psyched, and we were like, uh-huh. these guys are going to pay us, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, none of us have any money. Like, this is awesome. Like, let's do it. I mean, Alex was doing better than us, mm-hmm. but- um, Yeah, you I, probably I, didn't realize that this was going to add a ton of more pressure and- We were, like I said- All eyes were going to be on you. We yeah. Didn't, we didn't know. We also didn't realize, you know, that the guy that was running it was one of the masterminds behind Survivor- Mm-hmm. And that he was... Was that Mark Burnett? Um, well, it was it was Mark Burnett and this guy, Brian Turkelson. And Brian Turkelson, really, like I came to find out later, was, you know, really thinking ab- about how he could, you know, kind of play with the interpersonal dynamics sure. of the team. Create a little drama in there. Yeah. And so, you know, we... None of us saw any of that going in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess, you know, in hindsight, looking back, uh, you know, I would say that all of that, all of those external pressures and everything, it really tainted it. Mm-hmm. And um, and it's and it's kind of a shame. But it's all, it's just like sort of like sometimes we make mistakes and we learn from them. But um, it was definitely that kind of thing yeah looking back um it's really too bad because i think if if the three of us had gone on that expedition it was just the three of us and we didn't have like all these people watching us Mm -hmm. and having every little thing you do be filmed i think that it would have been a lot more fun Mm -hmm. than it was well you and alex butted heads on that expedition i imagine that must have been must have been heartbreaking for you a little bit because you probably looked up to him you know and yeah, he was, yeah. you know, the golden boy at the time. Everyone, you know, kind of idolized him. And here you are finally on an expedition and you guys aren't getting along and there's all these different dynamics going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I idolized him just like everybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, he was my hero. And, um, and that's why looking back, you know, I just kind of regret it. And I feel bad. And I, I, there's not too many things in my life where I'd say I'd go back and I'd do this again. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I regret that and the way that it turned out and the way that it unfolded 
it was just like one of these situations where it got out of control and I had no way of fixing it, you know? And once it went bad with him, I, I tried so hard to, um, to patch it up. You know, I write about that in the book Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it was a really hard thing to write about. Yeah. Um, but I, I did it because the reason why I put that in, in the, in the story in my book is because the, the Trango Tower expedition was about trying to document and capture the essence of what, what it means to do like an extreme climb. And that's what we were trying to do. We wanted to share it with mm-hmm. other people, which is a cool thing. It's what I've basically been doing ever since. It's what you're doing here. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the problem is that we ended up like the, the story that we were telling was the story of some guys telling the story about doing the climb instead of just having it be about the climb mm-hmm. itself and the, the documentation and the level of the strings attached tainted the essence of the thing that we were trying to share so that it wasn't there anymore to share. It got ruined in the process. And I felt like that was a theme that I wanted to trace all the way through to 2017 when Alex was, was, was climbing on El Capitan Mm -hmm. and he wanted to document the greatest climb of his life and he had all his reasons for wanting to do that and um and wow did that end up being like a really tricky hard thing you know to perform with camera guys watching your every move and everything and it did and um and i knew that you know because like it's sort of my story Mm -hmm. and so you know i wanted to kind of trace that back for people and to just kind of lay bare the idea that that uh Climbing um, is is such a, a a pure thing at its essence that it that it is hard to to capture and mm-hmm. to and to document it. And the moment you try to to grab on to it and turn it into something you know that other people you know can share in, you know you run the risk of of messing it up. Mm-hmm. So I imagine that's why you interweaved all these storylines in the book, because when I first read it, I was a little taken back because I was like, what is this? You know, you go into your own personal story, you go into the history of kind of like North American rock climbing, giving that background. And then you have Alex's story and it's kind of going back and forth. And at first I was taken back, but then I really started to dig it because it is this kind of quilt work of American rock climbing and it is all connected. Is that what you were trying to accomplish by, you know, telling all these different stories? Yes, absolutely. And um, I guess I would say, like, it's kind of awesome to sit here with you and to, you know, get feedback from people who understood the book uh-huh. and what I was trying to do. Um, but there's definitely some people who didn't get it. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you <laughs> yeah. know, who... Um, sort of like Alex Honnold super fans who all they want to hear about is Alex. They're tweaked, you know, when they see my story in there, they don't feel like I, you know, should have a, a part in the story. And um, you know, I, I guess they they sort of miss the essence of it. There's people uh-huh. that have said, Oh, it's really disjointed, you're here and there and the other, you know, and you're not tying it all together. But then I've had feedback from other people, some of whom are a little more savvy, potentially like yourself, who are like, actually, you did actually tie it all together. And 100%. You wove it yeah. all together into a thing. It's just sort of like I tried to do it in a subtle way without like bonking people over the head with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of the problem that I think I, I kind of ran into with this is that the book was packaged in a certain way and it it had Alex on the cover. It had a certain title and it had a certain subtitle and it was marketed in a certain way. And that is something that's done so that you can sell a lot of books. Mm -hmm. You can make money off this stuff. And I knew that, that, you know, like the outward appearance of it didn't capture the essence of what it really was. 
I saw that coming. Yeah. But, but, you know, and my publisher is amazing. And my editor, I mean, they're like the smartest people that I've ever worked with. And it's been like, um, like an incredible learning experience. And it's kind of sort of charted out a whole new path for me. Mm -hmm. So this isn't a, a criticism, but I, um, didn't actually have a say over like what was on the cover and like what it said on all that. And I wanted to have the cover photo be this picture of some people laying in El Cap Meadow and they're laying in the grass and you can see them looking up and you kind of know they're looking at El Cap, but you can't see it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that's perfect. It was a Tom Frost photo. Uh -huh. And I wanted to have a different subtitle and potentially a different title to the book. And I think just that little subtle thing could have changed, you know, like some of those people's perception. Mm -hmm. Because I know there were Alex Honnold super fans out there who just, yeah. like, I only want to read about Alex. And it's like, there's tons of stuff out there about Alex and there's a lot about him in this book. And you're going to get a pretty good feel for the whole thing in this book. But I want to um, kind of texture it and layer it like, uh -huh. um, you know, well, you need uh, a lot of that more deeply than, than that. But, you know, again, it's uh -huh. all part of the, uh, the, the learning experience. Um, I mean, it's super gratifying when I, when I talk to people who get it and I think most do, mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely some out there. Like I've stopped reading, um, reviews, yeah. you know, and I mean, I got completely, um, burned, you know, by the New York times. Yeah. I read that. I thought was really pretty, um, unfair and just mean spirited. Basically. I agree. I think, and I, I don't think, think it was fair at all. Had an axe to grind, Absolutely. you know, and I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. We're well, you can't please it. everyone. I've always been out there, you know, with the stuff mm -hmm. that I'm doing. But with this, it's like a, it's a whole new level, you know. Uh -huh. And I guess, you know, doing this with with you is cool because, like, it's awesome sitting here in your van and you're a climber and, you know, like this just like feels pretty, pretty casual and um, enjoyable talking with you. But I guess. You know, like what I tried to do with the book and what I'm trying to do right now and what I do with my talks and everything that I do is I just try to be me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do think that there are some phonies, you know, out there in this world and in the climbing community. And I just try really hard to not be that yeah. and to just and not try to have like an image of who I should be mm -hmm. and just be whatever it is, warts and all. Yeah. And just take my licks, you know, which is what I'm doing. But also, you know, like there's tons of benefits and good, you know, to come out of all this. And for me, it's it's been about, it's all about um, kind of like that journey that I started as a climber, you know, when I was a kid. My goal all along is just to like kind of shape up a life for my stuff, myself where I can just do like tons of cool shit mm -hmm. <laughs> as much as I can with cool people to provide for my family. I'm actually not really trying to save the world or anything like that. I'm trying not to screw it up, mm -hmm. but, um, hopefully, you know, inspire some people with storytelling and, and stuff like that. And just, um, yeah. So you said this new book or not this new book, but you said the impossible climb puts you on a new path. What is that path? Can you share well, the, the new path? I guess I would say is is to be an author, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, God knows how many articles I wrote for Climbing Magazine over the years. Yeah. You know, I have like every Climbing Magazine ever <laughs> in my basement, which I can show you. And I love Climbing Magazine; always has. I'm, I'm, I always have. I'm like totally like I'm your most loyal loyal guy i love and you guys that. like did a lot for me like i uh -huh. mean it all started there basically yeah. with the, the internship that i did in 1993 and so like that loyalty will will always be there but it the magazine game as you will know as better than anyone it's like it's really a hustle mm -hmm. and um there the, the the part that i never liked about it is the salesmanship so it's it's like the writing part is is fun and enjoyable and rewarding, but the selling articles to climbing or National Geographic or whoever, yeah. it's it's uh it's a completely different thing. It's it's marketing. And marketing is 
one of the things in life that I've never been good at. I mean, I can market like my dreams and mm-hmm. like my climbs and I can turn it on when there's something that I really want, but just pure like salesmanship has never been, you know, my strong point. Mm-hmm. And, um, the amount of selling that you have to do for the amount of money that you can make off a magazine article <laughs> yeah. is a bit of a losing proposition. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> and so writing books, you got to sell, mm-hmm. but you only have to do it like once every couple of years. Yeah. And then it's like writing like a bunch of really big articles. So I feel like that, um, is better. Uh-huh. And, and so because I've I've had a lot of success with the impossible climb, I mean basically, and that's what I was saying. I've learned so much about this. But like if you if you write a, you know, you're like a first time author, your book kind of has to be successful mm-hmm. because it's going to sort of define you. It's like there's data, and publishers are going to look at that. Oh, you're a this or that, or you pulled this off or that off, or ah, oh, we lost money or they lost money. We made money, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> it's business. Um, but because my book was successful, it puts me in a position to do it again. Uh-huh. And so that's what I'm doing now, and that's what I want to keep doing, you mm-hmm. know? So, I mean, I've always been a writer, but mm-hmm. now I think I'm, like, really and truly a writer. It's, like, what I do every day. Yeah. And um, and I'm trying to get better at it. I'm trying to not just do it, uh-huh. but to... Um, to grow yeah, and to learn. I mean, I've been doing it for so long and I'm still learning like basic things about grammar and things <laughs> yeah. like that that I never knew. And like, um, it's, inc- it's an incredible craft and, mm-hmm. and art form. And um, I actually don't think that I'm very good at it. Mm-hmm. And I'm incredibly critical of myself and underneath it all. Like, I mean, I have developed fairly thick skin from having done this for so long yeah i'd be out if if i hadn't because it's kind of brutal but underneath it all truthfully i am kind of sensitive to to like all the criticism and everything like Mm -hmm. you know most of us are you know i don't really like it that's why i stopped reading the reviews at first i was like reading them all i'm like this one's good i really like this person oh this one's bad i hate that person (laughs) i'll fight that person you know but uh, then after a while i was like yeah you know what i think i'm gonna let this go i need to stop like this is not healthy (laughs) and um so you know i'm i'm working on my next book now and uh i was down in the basement cranking away on chapter four when you got here like trying to get it right like yeah. not feeling that great about it like having certain parts like ah this will work this part's yeah this part's not that good and um you know it's painful but uh it's kind of what i do and i i i've always um sort of believed in trying to make life difficult mm-hmm. and i seem to be good at doing that yeah well i definitely really enjoyed your book i felt like it had authenticity and a genuine voice. And I really enjoyed your story with telling style. So I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, reading all your future books to come. I think that's about it. Awesome. Uh, okay for you? Absolutely. I think it's time for us to go in and get a beer or maybe, you know, like something even more potent and <laughs> yeah. have some dinner and go hang out with the family by the stove. It sounds great. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin. Well, that was fun. Want to thank Mark Sinnott for his time. And if you haven't already read The Impossible Climb, make sure you do so. It's a great read for climbers and non-climbers alike. Also want to thank our sponsor, Mystery Ranch. Check out their new line of climbing packs at mysteryranch.com. Today's theme music was provided by Small Houses at smallhouses.band. And please make sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. That's it. See you at the next base camp.